Have you ever received an unexpected message from a stranger online that seemed too good to be true? Can you recall a time when you or someone you know fell victim to a scam? How did the emotional impact compare to the financial loss? Have you ever wondered why some people are drawn to scams despite their better judgment? Do you think you could spot a scammer if you encounter one today? Or are scammers getting more sophisticated? What are some of the warning signs to look out for? How can we emotionally support a friend or family member who has been scammed? But also, what does it take for a scammer to change, leave behind a life of deception and make amends? Join me after the intro for a profoundly personal reflection to answer this and many more questions. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Rosanna D, and this is Forgiven Tribe, a podcast where we explore what thriving in life means and how we can achieve it, irrespective of our past, current condition, and expectations that those around us or society in general may have. Let's go. Welcome to the Forgiven Tribe show. A couple of weeks ago, I was waiting for a friend to come around for coffee. She was late, something quite unlike her. And when she finally arrived, she looked very distressed and she just went, I've been scammed. I feel so stupid. As I heard her, I felt a deep, soul-stirring resonance echoing through my heart because I know very well what it means to be scammed. And each story of scam I hear, a bit different, brings back the emotions that the past experience created in me the very first time. You are not just hearing a story or another story. You are relieving your own roller coaster of emotions. The shock of betrayal, the crushing weight of humiliation, and the silly anger at being deceived all bubble up to so face once more. From heart-wrenching online romance deceptions to elaborate financial frauds, from online shopping to competition scams, from computer hacking to job and employment scams. Each and every one comes with their specific methodologies and practices, but they all share something in common, the emotional roller coaster they cause on their victims. So today we are going to delve into the emotional aftermath of falling victim to a scam. We will share a deeply personal story, unravel the intrigues of the emotional roller coaster ride that victims endure, and ask the tough questions about if and how a scammer can potentially change. So first thing first, I've been scammed. A few years ago, I started to receive messages from what appeared to be a compassionate, down to earth and very caring man. It happened at a time of extreme vulnerability for me. I mentioned a number of times in this podcast that a few years ago, I had a physical and mental breakdown and it took me several months to return to a reasonable version of me. When the scam happened, I spent about 18 months in complete isolation. I was living alone in a foreign country, and when I fell ill, my network of friends literally melted overnight, like ice under the sun. Until I burned out, I thought I had lots of friends, that I was part of a community, that I belonged and almost overnight, I became a pariah. The rest of the world had quarantined me. I felt transparent. I had a pain inside my heart that wanted to come out and wanted to shout, hey, where are you all? Where have you gone? I'm here, I'm alone, and I don't like it. But no sound came out of my mouth. No message came out of my phone to seek for help to those very people that I thought were an important part of my life. I don't know why, but perhaps I felt ashamed to show this version of me and let them see me so frail and vulnerable. But the fact is, nobody kept in regular contact with me, and I didn't seek for help or support with any of them. It was as I had been sucked in a bubble and the rest of the world in a different one. You see, being seen heard, respected in our own opinions and experiences are basic needs that every one of us has. When these basic needs are not met, 
we grow a sense of frustration inside, a sense of helplessness that needs to be healed. How? Well, simple. By being seen, heard, respected with our opinions and our own life experiences. Simple, yes, easy, no. When I was approached by this man, I wasn't looking for a romantic involvement with anybody. Far from it, in fact. I was in the middle of a depression. I suffered of anxiety. I couldn't sleep or rest. Every cell of my body ached. And quite frankly, I looked and felt at least 50 years older than my ID card said. And talking, quite frankly, was not an easy thing to do. Yet I had the need to be seen and heard. I need someone who asked me how I was doing. And not because they were paid or had responsibilities in that sense, but because they wanted to know. Such a simple need. The loneliness was unbearable. It was as the rest of the world had forgotten about me, had moved on and left me behind and alone. I remember crashing on the couch and crying all my tears for hours until completely exhausted, I passed out. To this day, the memory of that time and the deep pain I felt still brings tears to my eyes. Nobody deserves to feel that way. Nobody deserves to feel they don't mean anything to others, that they don't deserve a simple message like, Hi, how are you? Do you know anybody that is going through a difficult patch in their lives right now? If so, don't leave them alone, because those unfortunately don't count. They cannot feel them. So without being overwhelming, let them know that you are there and you are there for them, not just to satisfy your curiosity. And if they are not able to entertain a normal relationship with you as they used to, well, consider that they might feel uncomfortable or perhaps even ashamed to show up as the person they have become. They might just think that they are a far cry from the person they used to be so they keep their distance. You see, when you feel alone, when you feel that nobody really cares for you, you slowly let yourself go. It's like sliding down a deep and dark hole. And in that situation, you will grab any rope that is sent in your direction without questioning if the rope is strong enough to bear your weight. Your priority is simply coming out of the hole and you are prepared to use anything that there and then could appear to be useful to you. The scammer that approached me and came into my life was my rope. He used to send me messages like how I was doing, what I was doing, if I had breakfast, and if I slept well. With time, the frequency of the messages increased. It felt good. I was no longer a pariah because someone in the world cared for me. And he appreciated so much the messages that we had that he used to say, oh, I really missed our chat today when I was at work. OMG, how good reading that kind of messages felt. Not only someone cared for me, but despite all my problems, I was still able to relieve their loneliness. Suddenly, I felt significant and important to someone. Fast forwarding a few weeks, one day, he sounded preoccupied. I asked what happened. After some resistance, he mentioned that he was having some financial problems. Nothing major, he said, but he didn't know what to do and how to find the money he needed. Then added not to worry that he would have found a way out. A way out? Oh dear, that sounded familiar. I knew all about feeling hopeless and in need for a way out. After a few days of no much chat, one day he mentioned those financial problems again and asked for help. He reassured me that after looking at all possibilities, I was his last resource. And reluctantly, he had decided to inquire whether or not I could help. He reassured me that it was a simple short-term loan that he could have repaid me monthly with his salary until completely extinguished. He needed a small sum of money, urgently. I resisted for days. I didn't know him well enough to the point I felt comfortable lending any sum of money. But then I felt also guilty, terribly guilty. 
I suppose the guilt came from thinking that he was there for me when I needed his help and nobody else was. And to some extent, it was true. He launched me a rope that helped me rise him back from my hole. Now he needed help. And instead of returning the favor and sending him a rope, I was quibbling about a bit of money that is worth to me he would have returned. I felt selfish. I felt as I didn't appreciate how much he helped me and how distressing that situation was for him. While I kept pondering on whether helping him or not, the number of daily messages started to decline. He apologized every time for not checking as often on me as he used to do, claiming that he was just working out possible solutions to his financial problems. He didn't seem to hold a grudge against me for not helping him. He said that he still enjoyed chatting with me as much as I did, and he would have spent even more time with me if he didn't have the other preoccupation. At that point, I gave up. I said that I would have helped him if he promised me he would have paid me back. So I did. I sent him, a total stranger, someone I never met in person, the money. The messages continued for a few days afterwards, and then suddenly they stopped. The money I sent had reached the other side. I didn't hear from him for about a week. My messages found no answer. My calls never picked up. I felt uncomfortable. I had been conned, and I knew it. I felt ashamed and guilty. How could I fall in such a trap? I was smarter than that. I should have known better than that, I thought. It was humiliating. Then the idea that perhaps I even had to explain to others what I went through, the why and the how of that situation was mortifying. So I felt uncomfortable, ashamed, guilty, humiliating and mortified. Then out of all the tears, I had an extraordinary, a sort of out of my body experience. I hugged myself tightly and said loudly, as I was talking to another person, you made a mistake. You let someone take advantage of you in a moment of vulnerability. So what? Shame on them. Your fault was wanting to have someone whose war was having a difficult time. Yes, Rosanna, you misplaced your trust, but it was done with best intention. And as for everybody else, well, fuck them. It was your money, your decision, your consequences. Yes, it was my mistake, my money, and my decision. I didn't have to justify with anybody else. That was one of the purest moments of self-love and self-forgiveness I have ever had. It washed away all the negative feelings that I grew in a matter of days and made me feel rather proud of myself. Yes, you heard me well, proud, because self-love and self-forgiveness are tough and quite difficult to grant. We tend to be so permitting with others and yet so strict and judgmental with ourselves. We are the first and most important person we should care for because Only then we are fit to care for those around us. It's like on a flight when the flight attendant says that in case of cabin pressure loss, we need to wear our oxygen mask first and then help those traveling with us, including children. Because if you stop breathing, you can't help anybody else. After being scammed, I became obsessed. I started looking around, searching for other con stories. And I'll beat the details were different each time. Each account was the story of a deception by real masters. People who can smell your vulnerability. They study how you think, what you care for, what your core values are. And only when they know and they get a good understanding of you, they start their scam, hitting you where you are vulnerable the most. They know very well what to say and how to say it, to make their stories believable, almost compelling for you. They know what to say to create that sense of guilt and shame while you resist from meeting the request. They play with your emotions and put you in a situation in which your thinking mind becomes completely disconnected. 
And if you think that this only applies to scams that develop over weeks and perhaps even months, I can tell you it is not. The other day, my mother was telling me of an elderly neighbor who was defrauded of his pension by a total stranger who claimed to be a friend of his son and told him that his only son had just been hit in a car accident. And when the police arrived, they noticed that his car insurance had inspired. So it was fined and his car taken away. Now, you may wonder, how come that this elderly man didn't question why his son let a friend, whom, by the way, he never met and talked before, go and talk to him instead of just phoning him? Well, easy. He was concerned for his son. His thinking mind was not engaged. Far from it. Scammers are often clever people. They think about what type of scams work best and when to deploy them. They use a variety of tricks and techniques to ensure that they can get people to believe what they are saying is true. Although there are so many little variations, I believe we can group them into two different categories. The first and furious scam that develop very quickly, usually through a few emails or phone calls, and those that develop over weeks and months, and require, like for example, for romance scams, a longer acquaintance. With email and telephone scams, the scammer sounds very official. For example, I'm the director of, followed by the name of some office or company, usually ill-pronounced. So you only get a feeling that it is something important. Chances are that to avoid appearing silly, we don't ask to repeat the name of the company or the office, and we are most likely to adhere with whatever they ask us to do. Because you see, when we think that someone has authority, even if they don't, we are more likely to believe and follow their instructions. They often attach also some form of urgency or threat to their communication. For example, if you don't pay this sum of money, this terrible thing will happen. You could get a fine or a service might be cancelled. When they don't ask directly for money, they might ask for the information they need to access your money. Like, for example, bank details. Threatening you that someone has allegedly hacked your account and they need to verify you to secure it. Using urgency or threats is how the scammer induces us to start panicking. Because when we panic, we are more likely to act on impulse and not think things through carefully. Interrupting their communication is usually very useful. Even just asking to tell us again the name of the office they are calling from, to spell it out, to give the office address, their full name, their telephone number. In many cases, you have had no business with the company they claim to be calling from, in which case you can cut it short, tell them that you are not interested and hang up. More difficult, obviously, is the situation in which they claim to be calling from a company you deal with, like, for example, a bank. In this case, you can mention that you cannot stay over the phone at that particular time and ask for their number that you will call them back shortly. In this way, you give yourself the time to check their story. One thing to remember is that a legitimate bank employee will never ask for all the details, like for example, full password, but only a few random letters that allow them to verify you as the owner of the account, but not enough for the caller to actually access it anytime. Scams that develop over a longer period of time are by far more ingenious because they are based on a longer and certainly more personal acquaintance, but also because of the longer time They often involve much larger financial losses than those that develop over a phone call. Beware of anyone who makes claims that sound too good to be true or push your emotional buttons. Take your time and ask questions. The more questions you ask, the harder it is for them to keep the story straight, reasonable and plausible. But who are these scammers? Why do they start this type of activities? The short answer is money, of course, but through my own story, 
and those that I learned about. I would argue that it's hardly a black or white situation and that, in fact, there are so many shades of grey in between. You see, in contrast to most scams, my relationship with the person who called me didn't end up there. And what happened next is perhaps the most significant part of my story. After about 10 days of total silence, I received a message. At first, I was disturbed by hearing from him again. Why now? I left many messages and none of them was answered. And now that I found the strength to forgive myself and made peace with what happened and started to move on with my life, it was back. What for? To disrupt my peace again? That peace that was held up in a precarious balance already and didn't need to be shaken up? How did it dare to show up again and prevent me from healing and moving on? What else did he want? More money, perhaps? Who did he think I was? He fooled me once, certainly he wouldn't be so lucky again. I was furious. While my head was spinning with all these thoughts, he started talking. He asked me how I was and that he had something important he wanted to say. I'm not the person I said I was, and I'm sorry for pretending to be someone else, he started. I replied I knew that he was a scammer, and until he had sent me back my money, there was nothing else to talk. I wanted to be left alone. He insisted that he wanted to explain. He wanted me to know why he behaved the way he did, what reasons he had for being so cruel with me. I didn't have the strength to stop him, so I let him talk and tell his story. I'm from Nigeria, he said, but I now live in Liberia. I'm 23 years old, and this is the first time that I've done anything like this, and I'm sorry. If I could, I would give you back your money, but I don't have it. I didn't take it. The account you sent the money to belongs to someone else who lives in the US. I asked who they were. He replied he didn't know who was really behind the whole scam. It was apparently brought in by someone he met. I asked him if he could help me to get my money back, and he said that he would have tried. There were some back and forth interactions, but I never really thought that I could get my money back. My reason told me to let him and the money go, to continue with my healing process through self-forgiveness and self-love. But something kept coming back to my mind. He was a 23-year-old boy. I was twice his age. I could have been his mother. I thought of how I would have felt and what I would have done if my child had behaved that way. Despite not having children on my own, I suppose my maternal instinct took over and I started talking to him. I asked him if his mother would have been happy and proud of the choices he had made. He tried to explain that in Africa, life is tough and that people do whatever they can to bring food to the table. He was sure, though, that if his mother knew she would have died for the sorrow and the shame, and he was so sorry for that. He said, I thought it would have been easy to trick someone else, a total stranger, for a bit of money and then use that money to start a small legal business in this country. That scam was his way to build his future. Obviously, not a good one, not a good choice, but in his mind, in the mind of a young man, that primordial instinct to survive and thrive made him con another person. At that point, I surrendered to any judgment. How would have my life been if I was in his place? What choices would I have made? How much goodness or evilness is within us from birth? And how much is caused by the circumstances or the environment we live in? Don't get me wrong, I'm not in any way trying to justify what he did and his reasons. It's merely an attempt to see the world with his eyes. And what I saw was no more than a boy who had little hopes, no inspiration to get a better life. Or he knew about the better life people in Western countries enjoy. In fact, he wanted to sort of 
emulate that life, get his piece of the cake, but he had no clue what to do and how to do it. He didn't have resources and came from a place of scarcity that made him just think and consider his condition, his life, his survival, his needs, and nobody else. A wrong way to be resourceful, I suppose. In his story, I was just the unlucky one who crossed paths with him. I thought, could I help him in a way that if he accepts this gift, it can help him even more than any sum of money he can imagine. I thought of saying something to shake him, to move him away from that mindset of scarcity and sow a few seeds in him to start changing his whole world, how he sees it that there is no Africa on one side and the rest of the world on the other, that the whole humanity is on the same boat, facing serious and very challenging problems, from pandemics to humanitarian emergencies, to wars, to climate change, just to mention a few, yeah, and that it was not just another desperate. It was someone who could help others, and by helping others, help himself to reach and live a more fulfilling life. And then I wondered how many teenagers from Africa and third world countries enter in the online scam racket every single year, hoping to turn their lives around and without considering the consequences on their victims. I then thought how many victims each of these potential scammers could make every single year. Surely the numbers are not going to be small. How much suffering could be avoided in the victims if only those young teenagers could be inspired to do something better with their lives, if they could be given opportunities, if they could be safe enough to dream. For the first time in months, if not years, I was dreaming. My dream was a scam-free world, and still is to some extent. And as crazy as it may sound, I sketch a high-level plan of what to do. I didn't speak about that with many people so far, to be honest. And this is the very first time I publicly mention it. This is a sort of moonshot, a dream to realize. And you may be smiling or even laughing at me right now. You may be thinking that this will never happen, that this is not realistic, that the interests behind scams are just too big for a middle-aged big crazy woman like me to solve. And you might be right, but so what? Aren't all the jumps in sign and technology, for example, the realization of a crazy dream? Wasn't reaching and landing on the moon an impossible dream before Apollo 11 landed on the moon in summer 1969? Yes, it is crazy. But isn't more crazy watching so many people in the world that in a way or another, affected by such a problem and do nothing. As a byproduct of my crazy dream, I found my mojo back, a bit of energy that I so much missed over the previous months and years. I had a big, massive project to take on, lots of challenges to address and face. In all this, the most important thing was that I no longer felt the anger and resentment towards the young man who called me. Will we ever achieve a scam-free world? Well, this much I know. For sure we won't if we don't try. What I learned is that if we find the strength to move the body center of our thoughts away from us and leverage our knowledge, understanding, and sensibility to consider others as well, we gain an energy, a sense of purpose and fulfillment that outbalance the pain, the anger, the resentment, the sorrow, or whatever feeling we may be experiencing. Incidentally, the young man who called me stopped any scam activity. This is what is worth to me, and I like to believe him. And I like to believe that what I said to him gave him a sense of purpose, changed him even so slightly, and inspired him. I can only imagine if I hadn't talked to him, but simply walked away with my pain and resentment, how many other women would have fallen in his net in a moment of vulnerability? If we think about that, my moonshot is already a reality that simply needs to be scaled. 
Well, I hope that this episode has provided some practical tips on how to avoid falling into a scam, but also food for thoughts on how any situation, even one that has written disaster in capital letters on the front page can bring us a gift, a blessing that if we accept and use promptly, has the power to change our life around in a way that we could have never imagined before. And I want to leave you with a beautiful quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, I live through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. So how about you? Have you or someone you know experienced a scam? If so, how did you overcome its emotional roller coaster? Or if you are still dealing with it, where are you in the healing journey? Can your mess be turned into a powerful message, a message that can benefit others and bring purpose and fulfillment into your life? If so, let us know. I would love to hear from you and your experience. Leave me a comment or any suggestion you may have. But as always, if you've been affected in any way by the topic we discussed today, get in touch. And if you've been scammed, please report it to the authorities. And most importantly, seek professional help to overcome the hurdles that could come from that experience. Don't feel ashamed, guilty, or mortified, especially if you were taken advantage of in a moment of vulnerability. Instead, practice some good and healing self-love and self-forgiveness. Or if you can, turn your experience into a message. Join me next time when we will continue exploring inspiring and challenging situations. Because remember, we are together in this journey. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this content, subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit the notification bell and like this video. See you in the next one.